Hello and welcome to the DeathCast. I'm your host, author and journalist Ian Totten. I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to take our fourth look at the life and crimes of disgraced British MP Cyril Smith. Before we get going this week, as always, I have the normal show notes. If you would like to follow me on social media, just search for The Deathcast, Deathcast Pod, or Deathcast Podcast. You can find me on most social media apps under one of those monikers. If you enjoy what I do, please consider leaving a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. It doesn't cost a thing, and it really is appreciated. If leaving reviews is not your thing, please consider joining the coffee club at buymeacoffee.com backslash the deathcast. Alright, now that all that is out of the way, find yourself a big comfy chair, kick back, relax, get yourself something to drink, I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes, let's go into the crypt. Now, when we left off last week, we were talking about how Cyril Smith had just evaded being prosecuted for abuses committed against children in Cambridge House in the early 1960s. These abuses came to a head in 1965 when the Hostel for Boys was officially closed, but that did not stop Smith's abuses. As we also discussed, in 1969, a new school opened up in Rochdale, headed by Cyril Smith. This was, of course, Knollview School. We may get into talking about some of that again this week. However, the time frame we're in, we're into 1971 at this point. Smith was really focusing a lot of his energies on his businesses, particularly Smith Springs, which was a spring-making company. Around this point in time, it's estimated that he had somewhere in the range of 70 employees working for him. Now, there is some discrepancy as to Cyril Smith's political allegiance during this period of time. Some sources state that after leaving the Labour Party, he was a member of an independent party that he and other members who had also left the Labour Party had formed, and that it wasn't until 1970-1971 that Smith decided to rejoin one of the mainstream parties. The reason I say there is a discrepancy is there are also sources out there that state that upon leaving the Labor Party, Smith was an independent only during the last portion of his mayoral career, and that he in fact rejoined the Liberal Party in 1968. In any event... Smith does end up rejoining the Liberal Party, which was the party that he had been aligned with when he was first starting out on a political career. And the reality of the situation is that Smith did this because he wanted to get back at the Labour Party. I'm going to explain why. During the 1968 elections, the Labour Party had swept Rochdale. And in doing so, they proceeded to target Smith, not only for having abandoned the party that brought him to power, but also for turning his back on them in the middle of his mayoral career. What the Labour Party ended up doing was systematically removing Smith from every committee that he was on in the town of Rochdale. Now, most of these were youth-oriented programs such as the Education Committee and Youth Sports, Youth Theater, that type of thing. It didn't matter. They set about removing him from these posts, but they went one step further in actually removing Smith from the Board of Trustees on the 29 schools that he was involved with. 
this, in fact, at least from the records I could find, does include Knollview School. Obviously, this had a devastating effect on Smith's psyche. So, Smith eventually decides he's going to get even, and the best way for him to do this is to go and rejoin the Labor Party. And the Labor Party was somewhat apprehensive at first, given the way Smith had flip-flopped between the two parties over the last 20 years. However, they realized that Smith was more likely than not their best opportunity to gain, regain some semblance of power within Rochdale in the coming elections of 1970. And while it's true that there were some individuals within the Liberal Party that, upon Smith's joining, decided to leave, those in power really saw his rejoining the party as a massive boon or windfall. Smith very quickly set about getting the nod to be the parliamentary candidate for Rochdale in 1970, and once this was secured, Smith set about campaigning. This was not a normal Cyril Smith-type campaign, however, in that Smith, while he did continue to do the door-to-door -door street politicking, Smith went even further and turned this particular election into a personal battle between him and the man standing for the Labour Party, Jack McCann. If you'll recall, Jack McCann was the individual who had kind of shepherded Smith during his early career and had informed him that his best chance of having a career in politics was to leave the Liberal Party and join the Labour Party. Smith went after McCann with both barrels blazing. One tactic that Smith employed was to drive through the town with a large speaker on the top of the vehicle similar to the speaker that was on the top of the main character's car in the Blues Brothers, calling out Jack McCann with statements such as, Vote Cyril Smith and get rid of your silent errand boy MP, and Vote Cyril Smith, let's remove the robot from Parliament. I have seen numerous article stating that the reason Smith lost the 1970 parliament election is because of the vehemence with which he went after his opponent. And I personally think that is more likely than not the case. However, Jack McCann was an extremely popular individual in Rochdale, and despite the power that Smith wielded, it is highly unlikely that looking at the two different candidates, the constituency would opt to go with the more brusque and brash Smith over McCann, who has been described as eloquent and gentlemanly. After Losing the election, Smith went back to the humdrums of daily life, and while he was still seen as a man about Pat Town, outside of his considerable wealth, his influence had been greatly curbed by the loss of not only the election, but also all of his cabinet positions. Then... At some point in 1971, he received a phone call from the head of the Liberal Party, Jeremy Thorpe, who informed Smith that there was the possibility of a by-election taking place in Rochdale because Jack McCann had suddenly passed away. 
He wanted to know whether or not Smith was interested in standing as the Liberal MP candidate for Rochdale. And Smith, by all accounts, told him he had to think about it, when in reality, he had already made up his mind that, yes, this was going to happen. He would stand as the Liberal MP for Rochdale, but more than that, he would win the seat for Rochdale. And he did this by running on a campaign with a very simple slogan that cut straight through any idea of party allegiances. Simply put, his slogan was, Vote Cyril Smith, the man. The platform that Smith used was basically his own personality coupled with everything that he had done for Rochdale since coming to power in the 1940s at age 23. And this was a very strong platform as the Labour Party had no one that they could put up against Smith who had anything close to the track record that Cyril had. Smith did more than that, however. If you'll recall last episode, I talked about how Smith began looking at the disenfranchised Pakistani immigrants who were living in Rochdale, and how these individuals, while they made up a fairly large part of the community, were really marginalized by both parties. Smith decided to target the Pakistanis as his key demographic, that is, those people who he knows that if he can get behind him are going to put him in power, and that is exactly what he set about doing. And as the story goes, Smith approached the largest Pakistani organization in the city of Rochdale and asked them if they would back him, pointing out the fact that the Labour Party not only was disinterested in them and their votes, but was actively working against their best interests, as the Labour Party's line at the time was they were taking jobs from honest, hard-working Bretonians, as well as diluting the public pool, so to speak. So the this Pakistani organization, they decided to see whether or not Smith was telling the truth, and a group of delegates went to the Labour Party campaign headquarters and offered to volunteer. And lo and behold, they were ignored by the volunteers already working at the campaign headquarters, and when someone finally did take notice of them, they pretty much told them to get out. They didn't need their help. Well, this was a major boon for Smith and a devastating blow for the Labour Party. As this Pakistani organization not only decided to back Cyril Smith, they went and got the other organizations within the city to back Smith and these, in turn, turned around and targeted the estimated 9,000 Pakistanis living in Rochdale to be supporters of Cyril Smith, something that no one had expected, not even Smith's own party. We'll get back to more of this in just a moment. Face it, shaker bottles suck. Your protein shake always comes out clumpy and you look like an idiot using the thing. That's why I decided to ditch my shaker bottle for good and get myself a BlendJet 2 portable blender. It makes perfectly blended protein shakes in just 20 seconds. BlendJet 2 is portable so you can blend up a smoothie at work, a protein shake at the gym, or even a margarita on the beach. It's small enough to fit in a cup holder, but powerful enough to blast through tough ingredients like ice and frozen fruit with ease. Blendjet 2 is whisper quiet, so you can make your morning smoothie without waking up the whole house. And it lasts for 15 plus blends and recharges quickly via a USB-C cord. 
Best of all, BlendJet 2 cleans itself. Just blend water and a drop of soap and you're good to go. So what are you waiting for? Go to BlendJet.com and grab yours today. And be sure to use the promo code DCASTPOD to get 12% off your order and free two-day shipping. No other portable blender on the market comes close to the quality, power, and innovation of the BlendJet 2. They guarantee you'll love it or your money back. Blend anytime, anywhere with the BlendJet 2 Portable Blender. Go to BlendJet.com and use the code DCASTPOD to get 12% off your order and free 2 days shipping. Shop today and get the best deal ever. Again, that's BlendJet.com and use promo code DCASTPOD at checkout. That's capital D, capital C, A-S-T, capital P-O-D, at checkout to get 12% off and free two-day shipping. All right, we are back. Now, when we left off, I was talking about the 1972 by-election that came about as a result of the death of M.P. Jack McCann and how Cyril Smith was able to get Roche Dale's considerably large Pakistani population to back him in this election. This was an extremely brazen move on Smith's part as, by and large, the majority of Bretonians looked down at their Asian neighbors were an unwanted and unwelcomed addition into their country. Racism was exceedingly rampant in Great Britain during the 1970s and even into the 1980s and 1990s. But at this point in time, much like in America, there was a lot of racial tension and a lot of racial violence. It was not unheard of for individuals to target Pakistani-owned buildings or businesses and to vandalize them in the middle of the night. This was compounded by the fact that the British government had put forth and approved a bill making it illegal for Asians to enter the UK as well as to join trade unions. One of the things that Smith began to do was to hold weekly speeches in the area of Rochdale where the Pakistanis generally lived. And this was seen by those living in those areas as Smith keeping his word that he will represent not just the people of Rochdale, but even the people of a foreign descent. And Smith ended up becoming very good friends with a number of the heads of these Pakistani political organizations. So much so that eventually when he passed and news of Smith's misdeeds came out, these same individuals would stand by Smith as being a good, decent human being despite all of his faults. And Cyril Smith did stay committed to the Pakistani people once he came to power as a member of parliament. There are numerous cases of members from the Pakistani community going to Smith with a complaint of the government trying to deport someone and Smith stepping in and basically stopping their deportation, but also of Smith helping these individuals gain basic civil rights within their communities. Rochdale fought vehemently against the building of mosques within the city, and Smith was the only politician to step forward and not only help them do battle, but also contributed funds from his own pockets in order to help ensure that they were victorious. Labor realized fairly quickly that 
Cyril Smith was not someone that they could take lightly in this election, particularly when the manager of the labor campaign in Rochdale left their party to join Cyril's. After this, the Labour Party sent a man by the name of Michael English, who was an MP from Nottingham West, to try and gauge the air in Rochdale. And he reported back to the leaders of the Labour Party that the whole town was for Cyril and that it looked, at least according to him, as though they did not stand a chance in hell of getting elected, which he was 100% correct in. On October 26th of 1972, Cyril Smith was elected as the new liberal MP from Rochdale, and he would not face any serious challenges to his position from this point on as he had so ingrained himself in the community there really was no one that any other party could put forward to even remotely equal the level of popularity and name recognition that Smith had in Rochdale. Cyril Smith's election in 1972 was really a turning point for the Liberal Party. Talking about it years later, he stated, quote, when I became MP, I was only the seventh Liberal MP, and if you take Devon and Cornwall out, I was the only English MP. It was the turning point for the party. They won four by-elections the year after, they, but they wouldn't have won any of them if I hadn't won. They never gave me the credit for that. And I think that statement really speaks to Cyril's own sense of self-importance. He really did see himself as not only a superstar politician, but also as one of, if not the most important politician in the Liberal Party. And this would cause numerous rifts and butting of heads in the years to come among himself and other members of the Liberal Party. And while Smith did not win every one of these instances, by and large, he bullied his own point of view across, much to the chagrin of those within the party who held higher seats of power than he did. This election also served to force Smith into the spotlight as he was a rarity in British politics and really at that point in time, politics in the Western world as a whole, as he did not come from a privileged background. He was really a self-made man. Yes, he had help from others who were wealthy, but by and large, Cyril Smith achieved everything that he had achieved up to this point in his life through his own blood, sweat, and tears. And when the media spotlight turned on him, Smith seemed to shine under its glare. As we discussed in earlier episodes, he really was a showman at heart. And now that he has a national stage, Smith is going to go on and become what many individuals feel he was always destined to be, which is a showman. You can find clips of Cyril Smith online where he's really out there portraying the buffoonish ass. And it's a role that fits him quite well, especially given his size. He mastered the art of facial expressions when he was doing things, exaggerating them in an almost comical manner for the cameras and for those around him. This is part of that innate charisma that I've talked about when it comes to Cyril Smith. 
Jimmy Savile also had this innate type of charisma, although Savile was able to turn that to his advantage and make himself arguably the biggest star in Great Britain. Cyril Smith was able to use this charisma of his to not only hide what it was that he was doing behind closed doors, and I'm not just speaking about child abuse, he was also able to use it to ascend to the heights of power within the British government while he was not the leader of his party. He was close enough to it during various points in his career going forward that he could smell it. And Smith used this power that his new position was to give him to get away with things that if any other MP had dared try to do it, would almost certainly have resulted in them being dismissed from Parliament and possibly having charges brought against them. I'm going to play a small snippet of Cyril Smith at this point. He's on the campaign trail. This is some point in the early 1970s. You can really get a better feel for the charisma he had and the rapport he had with the public from this snippet than you can through most other things that I could say about him. I haven't made him mind. No, I'm... You're not going to vote Liberal, are you? You must have. You're young and good-looking. It's inevitable. <laughs> Hiya. How are you? Oh, well. Do you like ginger, man? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you that? Yeah. Well, that's dead heat. Is it? Yeah, you don't eat him up all of you, are you? So, first thing I'm going to do is scalp him. Yeah. <laughs> now he's no head on, he's no brain, so it's Anna Wilson now, isn't it? Yeah. So, we'll get the feet from under him. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll give you the best bit, which is the liberal bit. Oh, yeah. Right. Have you got any on? There you are. Shut up. Right round, right round. Right this way. Hey, that's the champion. How are you, though? As you can hear from that piece there, Smith is on the campaign trail. He's in his dark suit, large overcoat with a gigantic red carnation on his lapel. And I'm, when I say carnation, it's gigantic. I mean, it's comically big. It's the size of a dinner plate. And in the second part of the clip, he comes upon a group of young boys. He asks them if they enjoy gingerbread, to which they reply, yes, they do. And then he proceeds to break the gingerbread man apart, proclaiming that it is a different member of the Labour Party with each break. This was a very typical Cyril Smith stunt. All right, we are going to take a break at this point, and we will be back in just a moment. I'm on the road a lot, and it's really hard to stay properly hydrated on the road. There's so many choices between water and sports drinks, many of them filled with sugars and other chemicals that leave you feeling run down afterwards. But what if I told you there is a better solution? Liquid 4 is the category-winning hydration brand fueling your well-being, and their hydration multiplier is the one product you're missing in your daily routine. In just one stick, you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone. Use it first thing in the morning, before a workout, when you feel run down, after a long night out, and on a long flight. One of the things I like best about the Liquid 4 Hydration Multiplier is their delicious flavor options such as sea berry, strawberry lemonade, concord grape, lemon lime, pina colada, or my personal favorite, watermelon. But Liquid 4 doesn't just taste good, it's good for you. Contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. And it has three times the electrolytes of traditional sport drinks. But best of all, 
liquid floor is non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy, which means that anybody can enjoy it, regardless of their dietary restrictions. And now, just for listeners of my show, you can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code DCASTPOD at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code DCASTPOD. So go to Liquid4, that's IV.com, and use promo code capital D, capital C, A-S-T, capital P-O-D, at checkout to get 20% off your order. Liquid 4 Hydration. It's time to take your hydration needs to the next level. And we are back. I have a fresh cup of coffee. You got a new pack of smokes. Let's dig back into Cyril Smith. One of the things that really helped to bolster Cyril's power base in and around Rochdale is the fact that his younger brother Norman soon ended up involved with politics, specifically the politics of Rochdale. And it has been said that while he held many different duties throughout his career, Norman's first priority was always to protect his brother's public interest, but also to ensure that anything unpleasant did not make it to the press. And this wasn't something that was without precedent, as not long after Cyril was elected in the 1972 by-election, stories about the things that he may or may not have been getting involved with at all of the various schools that he was tied to throughout Rochdale began filtering out into the community. And that is something that is important and does need to be looked at in depth to some degree. For years, the story was simply that the government had covered for Cyril Smith with all of his varying degrees, citing national security. However, interviews that were conducted with individuals in Rochdale revealed that many in town, if not the majority of those in town, were aware that Smith had a penchant for boys. And while many people in town did not believe these stories, it says something as to the level of his offending that these stories did at least make the rounds and while did not really bubble to the surface until later in the decade, they at least lay within the minds of those in Rochdale who had a desire to listen to them. According to the book Smile for the Camera, The Double Life of Cyril Smith by Simon Danchuk and Matthew Baker, stories of Smith's abuses were very well known in the bars of Rochdale. According to a man by the name of Dominic Carmen, who was the son of George Carmen, quote, I heard about Cyril's abuse of boys. I used to visit Rochdale in the 1970s, and I heard people talking about it at the hotel bar on numerous occasions. And the writers of this book heard numerous stories such as this. Here is the problem with Cyril Smith and his abuses. And no, I'm not saying that he did not commit any of these abuses. Every story that I have encountered about Cyril Smith, with the possible exception of his first known assault in his office falls far outside any other type of historic sex abuse that I have ever read about. There are no stories, at least, that I could find of Cyril Smith doing the types of things that you normally associate with 
childhood sexual abuse, and by that, please pardon my language, I'm talking about penetration, or some form of overt sexual activity. Everything I have read about Cyril Smith, all of his abuses seems to have been in the fondling and brutal beating type nature, followed by caressing, which makes it difficult to fully grasp the type of predator that Smith was, because as we know from other cases that have been covered here in the crypt, many of these individuals, there's a desire for power, but there's also that sense of sexual gratification that comes from doing the things that they do. Smith does not appear to have had that extra step where he's getting that sexual gratification from the violation of boys. At least he's not getting it in the traditional sense of the word. And I want to be clear on something here. Yes, there are stories out there of Cyril Smith having done things to boys that are much worse than what I have already discussed him having done. However, those stories appear to have originated in the forms of rumors that stayed that way up until the time of Smith's death, when actual stories of his verifiable abuses started to come out and people started to look into him and the things that he had done and how much what he had done was covered up by the powers that be. And it's unfortunate, though, that those rumors about him doing more than we know for certain that he did have remained just that, rumors. Now, it could be that he did these things, and I feel deep in my gut that he most certainly did. Otherwise, those stories wouldn't be out there. But I have to imagine that the boys that he took those further steps with were so emotionally and mentally scarred by these th actions that they simply chose or have chosen not to come forward and reveal that. What I can say with certainty, however, is that Cyril Smith did not act alone in his abusing of boys. After being elected as the MP from Rochdale, Smith very quickly was able to get himself placed back on all of the councils that he had previously been on and back on the Board of Governors for the schools that he had been involved in, particularly with the Knollview School. And a lot of the stories of abuse perpetrated by Cyril Smith and his cohorts come from this period of time after Smith is put back on the Board of Governors and now he's got that Member of Parliament badge to hide behind. There are stories about Smith and other known pedophiles going into the school together and abuse taking place in concert between Smith and these other individuals. There are also stories of lone pedophiles being given access to the school and committing horrific abuses against the boys. And I have seen some commentators state, mind you, this was prior to Smith's death, that he more likely than not did not know these other individuals were going into the school and doing these things. Cyril Smith knew every single thing that was going on in Knollview School and every other school that he was a part of. To imagine that he did not know that a, another pedophile was going into what Smith saw in his own mind as his own private hunting reserve is completely asinine. And while he may not have participated in these other individuals' abuses, 
he most certainly gave them the nod to go ahead and do it and let them know that it was okay for them to do these things so long as they were somewhat discreet and did not get caught. Now, these next bit of information that we're going to cover, again, comes from Smile for the Camera, the double life of Cyril Smith, and the report compiled by the Rochdale Council entitled Cambridge House, Knollview, and Rochdale. In the 1970s and all the way up until the 90s, as we discussed last episode, it wasn't only Cyril Smith and other men who were coming into Knollview School and perpetrating sexual offenses against the boys. It was also the older boys within the school who were preying on the younger victims. And it has been discovered that many of these older boys who were preying on the younger had themselves been victims of abuse from adults. And at least according to the report from the Rochdale Council, quote, these records also demonstrate that pupils from the school were involved in sexual activity that was of concern in the 1970s and remained of concern in the 1990s. A report re prepared in 1976 by Terence Hopwell, who succeeded Mr. Turner as head teacher, documented the fact that five named boys had been found out of bed and that there was evidence of sexual malpractice among them. The report concluded that this behavior had been ongoing for a number of years. Even at this early stage in the life of the school, Mr. Hopewell was to observe, it has become clear that this sort of behavior has become a subcultural tradition. Other records about one boy, R.O., a137 from 1976 and 1977, when he was age 15, documented concerns that he had contracted pubic lice from homosexual contacts. The boy is referred to in a note in 1977 by then deputy head teacher Mr. Wynn, which recorded that A R O A137 had been introduced to an undesirable element, older men, by another boy. ROA140, also 15. ROA140 was regarded by Mr. Wynn as using older men for alcohol and money. Mr. Wynn noted that ROA140 was very much at risk and that he had also taken two boys from Nullview School into very serious situations. The extent of this risk was borne out by ROA140 contracting a sexually transmitted disease. Although it is not stated in direct terms, it is clear from these records that a reference to ROA140 receiving money from adult men was a reference to him being paid to engage in sexual activity by adults. Dr. Simpson thought that police should be involved, and he wrote to the chief education officer to inform him of his concerns. But there was more going on in Knollview School than just Cyril Smith and his friends preying upon the boys and the boys preying upon one another. In the report from the Rochdale Council, there are statements given about teachers and other staff members, including janitors, written up, reprimanded, and fired for having unnatural relations with those who were in their care. One of these actually came from 1980, where a female teacher was said to have taken one of the students home with her that evening, and she was given a final warning that this type of behavior would not be tolerated and that, that it needed to stop immediately. And I'm going to stop for just a moment and dive into something. There is a term that most of us in the West, particularly in the United States, have heard used repeatedly in the media, oftentimes when they are trying to debunk a claim of sexual abuse particularly in this day and age when they're talking about the whack jobs from the QAnon, and we're not going to get into all that. 
But the term that they like to frickin' throw around and say does not exist is systemic abuse. Systemic abuse is abuse of individuals. They don't have to be children. It can be old, they're individuals. It can be adults. It can be children within an organization. And the organization is set up in such a way as to protect the abusers and keep that information from coming to light. We have seen things similar to this in other cases that we have covered, particularly with Sidney Cook and the ring that he ran, but also with the BBC and Jimmy Savile, and not just Savile, but the entire entertainment industry that he was surrounded with. Okay, there was systemic abuse going on. People knew about it and did nothing to stop it because there were checks in place to stop that information from coming out, but there were also checks in place that let the individuals who might be a whistleblower on this know that you may have serious repercussions if you move forward with this information outside of our little circle here. Oftentimes, those who were wanting to go forward with this information were told that you'll be liable for a lawsuit because you can't prove it, or you will be fired if you continue on with this line of investigation, or, and this one was the most common, don't you know who that is, just keep your mouth shut. That is what happens with systemic abuse, and that is what we have going on at this point in time with Knollview School. There are people who are coming into the school and making reports about this. However, the abuse is so widespread and so entrenched in the very veins of the school that people either turn a blind eye or obstification takes place and those people's concerns are never allowed to get out to the people that need to know about it. And this wasn't just a problem at Knollview School. It was also a problem throughout the entire United Kingdom in these schools, in the church, in orphanages, all over the place, and it wasn't just in Great Britain, it was in Australia, it was in the United States, Canada, South America, most of Western Europe. This kind of systemic abuse was taking place, and in some places still takes place. However, those who were doing the abusing were able to get themselves into such a position of power that they were able to block the information from coming out and also able to protect other abusers. It's only in certain instances of horrific abuse where they were unable to do so, and we're going to talk about one of those cases at this point. And again, this comes from the report Cambridge House, Knollview, and Rochdale. In this report, they talk about an individual by the name of Robert Hilton. Now, Hilton was known to be a pest by those who worked at the school. Hilton was said to have frequented the school over the course of roughly two years, and Teachers received reports from numerous students that Hilton had been touching them inappropriately. These teachers did turn around and pass this information onward. However, Hilton continued to show up to the school unabated. On multiple occasions, teachers caught him in the act of either abusing or attempting to abuse a child and were able to force Hilton off of the grounds. However, much like an annoying mosquito, Hilton would return later to continue on with his activities. Now, Hilton's transgressions happened after the 
point in time of most of the story that we've been talking about at this point, which is the 1970s. Hilton is known to have begun visiting the school at some point in 1983 or early 1984, and it was discovered by a staff member that Hilton had been carrying on an inappropriate relationship with a 14-year-old boy. This is after the school had received numerous complaints about Hilton, and Hilton had been removed from the school grounds on those occasions. However, it does not seem that anything was done about this particular incident. However, a report dated February 8th, 1984, from Mr. Hopwood, who was the then current head teacher, states that two pupils had been sexually assaulted by Robert Hilton, with the abuse having had occurred over the weekend of January 27th through the 29th. It is interesting to note that in this report, Hilton is described as having been, quote, the victim of cunning children. Hilton is further described as a, quote, slow-witted 18-year-old youth whom the boys had known to have had homosexual tendencies before going on to further state that it was the belief of this Mr. Hopwell that the two students had devised a plan whereby they could trick Mr. Hilton and rip him off by promising him sexual favors in return for cash. However, the report compiled by the Rochdale Council paints a much different picture of what actually happened on the weekend of January 27th through the 29th. According to their report, three older boys had connived to provide Hilton with children for him to be abuse and had arranged for Hilton to get on the school grounds during that weekend, at which point these three boys took two younger boys to Hilton, at which point he sexually abused them. I'm going to quote directly from the report. The reality of what happened is that three pupils from Noel View were involved in bringing two other pupils to Hilton so that Hilton could sexually abuse them. There are a number of features about the record of this incident that are troubling. Apart from its portrayal of Hilton as having been duped, the first is that it conveys no sense of the two boys who were sexually abused by him as being victims. There is simply a passing reference to them having been examined by a general practitioner who declared them free of infection. Second, it appears that a considered decision was made not to tell the parents of the children involved what had happened. Third, there appears to have been no investigation as to how Hilton was known to the three boys who brought the other children to Hilton, or how they were able to bring them to him. Fourth, there is a passing reference to pupils from Knollview School informing the head teacher that Hilton was drunk and making threats to come into the school with a knife, but there is no mention of how these threats came to be made. Hilton did end up getting arrested over this assault and ended up being convicted. However, this was only for one sexual assault perpetrated against one boy. Hilton ended up getting two years probation on March 19, 1984, and there was very little press information about this assault that took place at Knollview School. It's more likely than not that Cyril Smith had a hand in making certain that this information did not receive wider press attention as were that to have happened, it is very probable that not only would Smith's crimes had come up, but also those of other individuals working in and around the school. And I suppose it really paints a accurate picture of the school that Hilton did not stop going to Knollview School after his conviction. In fact, it seems as though he had continuous access after this 
sporadically. What is known is that in 1990, he again was convicted of assaulting a student that went to Knollview School and was actually given a prison sentence. However, in 2014, one of the two boys who had brought student victims to Hilton went to the police and informed them that he, in fact, had been a victim of abuse. This was perpetrated by a teacher who apparently abused this young boy over a, an extended period of time. According to this victim, it was this teacher who had informed him that he needed to bring other children to Hilton. And according to this boy, that on least two occasions when he did bring victims to Hilton, Hilton had paid him $14. This victim further stated that at least one occasion the victim he had brought to Hilton began to fight with Hilton and hit him with a bottle leading to Hilton deciding not to proceed with this particular assault although the boy did state that Hilton threatened him after this incident stating that if something like this were to happen again he, the boy who was bringing the victims to Hilton, would himself become a victim of Hilton's assaults. So that is where we are going to leave it for this week with just further evidence and views on what's going on at Knollview. Cyril Smith is now an MP. He is rapidly growing in popularity, not only on a local, but also a national stage. And when we come back next week, we're actually going to jump ahead quite a bit to the late 1970s, where Smith is said to have been responsible probably for the most important act that took place during his time as an MP, and we're further going to get into the things that he was doing behind the scenes, along with a whole lot more. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please share it with your friends, and also consider leaving a five-star review wherever it is you find your favorite podcasts. The Death Cast is a co-production of Corpse Creek Publishing in association with Big Pond Podcasts. Until next time, stay morbid.